welcome to this uh, Green Alliance online event for the Circular Economy Task Force. As you know, we always like to set ourselves very large questions to solve in an hour. And this one is quite large. How do we stop our resource use driving climate change and biodiversity loss? Well, in a moment, I'll introduce you to our panelists who've, um, who've got some very good takes on how we might do that. Um, thanks very much for attending because I know there's a lot of demands on your time. So I wanna say that first of all. Um, now, one of the things that we are doing today and possibly the principal thing is that the Green Alliance is, Green Alliance is launching a new report targeting success, why the UK needs a new vision for resource use. And we'll hear a little bit more um, about that in a second when uh, Libby Peake introduces the report. Um, but that really gives us our framing, doesn't it? Because uh, according to the UN, resource extraction and processing is responsible for 90% of global biodiversity loss and half of all carbon emissions. Um, so in my job, I'm principally obsessed with communication and I kind of want to know how that narrative is so underserved because those, I mean, that's a, that's a big, big statement. So I think part of today is really sort of navigating why that might be and what needs to be done to break through whatever barriers um, are um, causing it to be impeded. So um, we know this is a big year for climate and nature, and that's something of an understate understatement. Um, we know as well that we really should be leading on this agenda. And I suppose in a way we can't really, we can't afford to have underserved narratives, um, especially when they are um, of critical importance. Um, so, as I say, we're here to launch a new report um, and we're also going to hear um, from our expert panellists. As always, it would be really, really great if we could take your questions. Um, and um, to do that, in time on a tradition, you will need to enter them into the chat box. <laughs> um, and we'll try and leave about 20 minutes for questions as well. So, you know, please do get involved. Um, let me introduce you to our panelists and then um, we will hear from Libby who will introduce the report and we're also going to see um, an animation as well. Um, panelists, just give us a wave when I talk about you, if you wouldn't mind. Um, Professor Lorraine Whitmarsh um, sort, of, sort of needs no introduction in many respects. Thank you for joining us today. I'm an environmental psychologist specialising in perceptions and behaviour in relation to climate change, energy and transport. Lorraine is based in the Department of Psychology at the University of Bath. Um, she is director of the ESRC funded UK Centre for Climate Change and Social Transformations and was one of the expert leads um, for Climate Assembly UK and is lead author for the IPCC's Working Group um, Six Assessment Report. Um, she has uh, written and contributed to reports on um, kind of all aspects of this and consumer behavior and smart technologies, low carbon technologies. So we'll be fascinated to hear from you, Lorraine. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Colin Church, thank you very much for joining us. Good wave. Uh, Colin is Chief Executive of the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining, the Global Network for the Materials Cycle, Chair of the Circular Economy Task Force, led by Green Alliance, um, and uh, Trustee of Chem Trust, Board Member of the Society for the Environment, a Fellow of IOM3, and um, was previously the CEO of CIWM, the Professional Body for Resource and Waste Management. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, we're also waiting to be joined um, by um, uh, Dr. Ashok Kosla from India. He's joining us from New Delhi. I'm sure he'll be along soon. And we have with us, of course, Libby Peake. Hello, Libby, Head of Resource Policy at Green Alliance um, and uh, works closely with many NGOs, you probably all know her, academics and businesses to promote the better use of resources throughout the economy. And this includes managing the circular economy task force. Um, her recent reports include by popular demand what people want from a resource efficient economy, building a circular economy, how a new approach to infrastructure can put an end to waste, and plastic promises, what the grocery sector is really doing about packaging. So, um, you know, to borrow from Joni Mitchell, she's looked at this from all sides now. And um, I think we are ready for you, Libby, to introduce the report and the extra dimension that you are um, bringing through today. So um, over to you and Ollie, I think, who's gonna help us 
with um, the animation. Great, thank you, Lucy, and thanks everyone for being here today. Uh, I'm going to start with the animation. It's Green Alliance's first ever animation. Uh, and as Lucy says, we have some really big questions we're trying to answer today. This, this attempts to distill it down into less than two minutes. Um, and if Ollie can get the screen up to start it's sharing, uh, I think we're ready to go. We all hate waste, but unnecessary waste is hardwired into our economic system. If the whole world consumed as many natural resources as we do in the UK, we'd need three Earths to supply them. According to the UN, extracting and processing resources is causing 90% of biodiversity loss and water stress around the world and driving half of the world's carbon emissions. And the more resources we use, the more pollution we create. There are lots of reasons why our economy is so wasteful. Some things are actually made not to last at all. We can't easily repair the broken items we love and want to keep. Sometimes we buy things we don't really need. And some things made to last never get the chance. It doesn't have to be this way. There are plenty of solutions that can help to create a circular economy where products and the valuable materials they're made of are kept in use for as long as possible, meaning we don't have to keep making so much stuff. But the government strategy is still fixing single problems instead of the whole system. Unlike the plan to eliminate UK carbon emissions by 2050, there are no targets to cut resource use and help our economy change. We need bold targets and a plan to halve the UK's resource use by 2050. Great, so that's our first ever um, animation. Do please feel free to share it on Twitter as we're about to start uh, releasing it uh, and trying to trying to make it seen as widely as possible. Uh, and just before we get to, to the rest of the panel, I'm going to run through a brief presentation that counters through the, the main findings and recommendations from the report that that animation is based on. It was released this morning and it's called Targeting Success, Why the UK Needs a New Vision for Resource Use. It's the final report that we've we're putting out for our two-year program um, for the Circular Economy Task Force. Um, and I think it, it's no exaggeration to say that uh, we wouldn't have been able to do this work and we wouldn't actually even be here today if it weren't for the support of the task force members who are these companies that you see on the screen in front of you. So a big thank you to them right at the start. Um, the first stat I'm going to start with is actually one that Lucy picked up on, on as well. It was in the animation and it was also in the invitation you had to this event. But I do think that it really bears repeating. Uh, resource use, according to the UN, so that's extraction and processing, drives 50% of climate emissions and 90% of biodiversity loss, as well as water stress around the world. And it's such a shocking and compelling statistic to me. And what that says it, to me is that if you, if you can crack the the issue of resource use and, and make it uh, much more in line with what planetary boundaries allow, you can get a good way towards meeting our climate targets as well as uh, preventing nature's decline. And so we know this, we hear this a lot. It's clear that governments know it to some extent um, and government has promised at least on a, a, a uh, domestic level to address this. So the, the quote that you see in front of you is from when Michael Gove was Environment Secretary releasing the 2018 Resources and Waste Strategy. Uh, and obviously resources is a devolved matter and some of the, uh, the other administrations have their, their own strategies as well. Um, but this, this goal of England to, to me sounds overwhelmingly vague. So it's good, but it's, it's a more circular economy. And it's backed up by some targets, but a lot of the time they're, they're voluntary. A lot of the time they don't, well, actually none of the time do they address the, the overconsumption of resources. And so we think that that's something that, that really needs to change um, and they need to adopt a new approach uh, that is much less about piecemeal solutions. 
So if you have things like uh, plastic straw bands and even product standards to ensure that things like electronics are better, these are things that are that are good in their own right and, and potentially necessary. But if you add them up, they're still not going to create a circular economy that the government says it's aiming for. Um, and this is despite the fact that they've promised to address every stage of the, the material cycle. It's still overwhelmingly on individual products and, uh, and individual waste streams. And the thing is, there are lots of solutions, as we highlight in the, in the animation, uh, lo lots of different options that, that could be used at, at various stages to encourage this more circular economy. But I think without this, without an overarching clear vision uh, and a strategy that, that indicates who needs to use these solutions and when, these different business models and, and options are, are sort of doomed to, to remain on the fringes rather than becoming central to, to the economy. And so what we'd like to see instead is a much clearer vision and a plan that, that will not just address those single issues, but get, get everything right, right across the board. And so there's a, there's a few things that need to be got right on the screen now. It's, it's not an exclusive, exhaustive list. So we need to get the right incentives. We do need to continue getting better products. We need people's and businesses' behaviors. We need new business models. We need to ensure that the logistics are set up so that we can have these new business models, as well as getting the right infrastructure in place. And there's no real coherent plan to, to getting that done. The thing is, such an overarching framework is not with, to, to a massive environmental problem is not without precedence in the UK. And for carbon, we know exactly where we want to get to. So this is a this is a CCC graph um, that shows clearly the destination. So for carbon, we want to get to net zero emissions by 2050. And we stay on track to that goal with expert advice from the Committee on Climate Change, amongst others, who help the government set legally binding carbon budgets to, to stay on track and make sure that we get there. And also crucially make recommendations for specific sectors to ensure everyone is, is pointing towards that one common goal. And so I wouldn't exactly say that it's as easy as one, two, three to get there for resources, but I think that if we adopted these three steps uh, and, and really put a lot of effort into it, we could replicate the success for climate uh, that, we, that we need to see for resources. So the first thing that we want to see is an ambitious target for cutting resource use. Um, this is something that actually the European Union is discussing. The, the, the Parliament has called on the Commission to, to implement something like this. And Wales has actually already promised that they're going to have a target for one planet uh, sustainable, one planet resource use by 2050. So this is exactly the sort of thing that we think the UK should be adopting. And the evidence suggests that it should be about, uh, they should be aiming to, to cut resource use by about half. Um, and we also need to see plans for specific sectors, which will obviously have their own challenges when it comes to resource use, as well as for specific materials, because there are some materials like critical raw materials that are potentially uh, used in smaller quantities, but are strategically important to keep the economy going and so need their own plans. And the last thing that we'd like to see is binding interim goals, because 2050 is obviously a long way away uh, and it's, it's going to be quite difficult to get the the framework right for businesses to operate in and to set up the, the um, business models and, and whatnot that we need unless we've got these clear short-term strategies and policies pointing to that one long-term goal. Um, so that's all I'm going to, to say for the moment, but thank you all for, for coming along and I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into the conversation. Great, thanks Libby. Um, just a quick question. So um, you're, you're recommendations in this report are really clear you know and you've talked about how we need something uh, you know replicating net zero and we need this we need this system and these goals what would happen without it if that's not a weird question are you suggesting that you know circular economy protocols and this dynamism would kind of wither and die on the vine because heaven knows i'm not a kind of let the market decide type of girl but we are seeing um, things start to creep in. I know the fashion sector very well, for example. And because there's such a problem with returns, clothing returns with online shopping, um, rental is becoming attractive to big fashion brands. 
So my question really is, wouldn't these kind of start to happen anyway? Or what is the what is at risk here if we don't take this action that you're recommending? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are lots of innovative businesses out there that, that are trialing some circular economy solutions. And, and we do see this actually a lot in fashion. But um, I think the pace of change that we need to see and the dominant um, the dominant business model isn't going to switch over uh, at the pace we need it to unless we have much more robust guidance from government. Um, so, I mean, in the fashion sector, we've had some we've had voluntary agreements to reduce impact for, for quite a long time. Uh, but those have been per tonne uh, of, of clothing used rather than overall impact. And so we've still seen that the, the overall impact has actually increased, even if they're getting better per ton. And I think the the rate at which the, the consumption of clothing needs to go down, particularly in the UK, is so fast that, that these small business models who are doing the right thing and showing the way aren't going to become ingrained as the mainstream unless there's clearer government guidance. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to go to um, uh, Lorraine in a second. Uh, Dr. Ashok, so nice to have you with us. We'll let you get your breath and then we'll come back to you. Thank you very much from New Delhi. Um, uh, so um, Lorraine, we would you be able to talk about this as well um, from the, um, I don't like calling people consumers because I think we're global citizens, but we are all consumers. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd love some insight as well into what you think the consumer will accept and where their place is on this. So over to you. Thank you, Lorraine. Thanks, Lucy. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think changing resource use to bring it within planetary back boundaries will require buy-in across society. Um, with people doing much more than just recycling, um, that's great. And we need to continue to do that and upscale that, but, but much more too. So a sustainable transformation in the UK would actually lead to a very different looking society, um, as, as we've already heard. So people buying less, engaging in repairing and um, sharing activities, and really embracing new models of product ownership. So this means really significant behavioral and lifestyle change, as well as wider institutional, cultural, technological changes as well. Um, and our research shows that while climate change concern has continued to increase, even undented by COVID, interestingly, um, amongst the public, awareness of the role of material consumption in driving emissions and, and wider environmental problems is actually quite low. Um, and, um, uh, and research also shows that there's quite low awareness um, amongst the public of how to rent and repair things, what, what can be rented and repaired, what sort of sharing services are available, even though, as we've heard, there are some really exciting examples um, starting to emerge. So one thing we need to do is raise awareness, uh, not only of the growing number of platforms and businesses offering rentals, rep repairs, swaps, gifting, etc., um, but also of the environmental, social, economic and well-being benefits of the sharing and circular economy. So, for example, quite a growing body of evidence now shows that those with less materialistic and more sustainable lifestyles tend to have higher well-being. So it's these sorts of wider benefits um, that can actually, I think, serve to engage the public more in these sorts of activities because they can sort of see that this is something that, you know, speaks to things that are important to them. Um, but we need to do more than just give them information. Um, sharing, repairing, buying fewer new things, buying less polluting things, that all requires a range of measures, as Libby's described, to make things more convenient, cheaper, and more normal, basically. So we need to sort of challenge the status quo, the assumption that buying lots of stuff makes you happy and is and is normal is that is what we should all be aspiring to. So this is about changing cultural norms. Um, and there's something in there, I think, around sort of pervasive marketing and advertising as well. Those are obviously significant barriers to reconceptualizing the role of consumption in our lives and challenging the assumption that buying more stuff makes us happy. And I think there may be opportunities linked to COVID here for challenging some of these assumptions because um, our research shows that people's material consumption, of course, has dropped a bit in the last year. 
Um, and people have tended to spend their time doing fairly low carbon sorts of um, activities and pastimes, reading, creative hobbies, gardening. Um, and many say they do find those things intrinsically enjoyable. So they, they do sort of satisfy people's psychological needs, et cetera, in a way that material consumption tends not to. Um, so while there may be some rebound um, post COVID in consumption, I think if we can encourage people to reflect on these sorts of things that actually do give deeper levels of fulfillment and satisfaction and happiness and put in place measures to enable people to, to actually engage in these sorts of services, I think we have a better chance um, of a green recovery. Um, I'll leave it there. Uh, there's so much to unwrap there and we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to it. I'm just thinking about Instagram where um, there isn't the, the kind of idea that less gives you better well-being. Let's just say it doesn't really come across. So, you know, what, what do we do and how significant are these kind of um, social media platforms which are essentially set up to drive consumption? Yes, a massive, a massive problem, I think. I mean, you know, from the work that we've done, like including with the UK Climate Assembly as well, you know, there is really broad public support for challenging these kind of cultural norms around consumption. I think, you know, a lot of people sort of feel that they don't really want to be kind of having to upgrade their phone every couple of years and buying more stuff when actually the things that they have could just be sort of, you know, serviced and 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 um, maintained for, for much longer. So I think there is a sort of willingness to change in many ways. But I think, as, as Libby sort of said, we do need sort of to change the rules. We actually need kind of maybe um, regulation to actually um, start to shift shift things in a direction so that we're not constantly given messaging um, around you know um, how these sorts of things make us happy when actually there's massive carbon impacts or biodiversity impacts so we need I think we do need to look at kind of maybe regulating some of the sort of um, media and advertising around these these products. Very quick bit of insight I've hosted a lot of panels for the TV industry on cutting carbon and they're very very keen to cut carbon in production and all that kind of thing. They do not want to have a conversation about promoting consumption, whether it be in the shows themselves or obviously in advertising. Um, so that's another point. Thank you, Lorraine. We'll come back to you in a second. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ashok Kosler to the um, to the to the discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, again, really needs no introduction. Um, uh, Ashok has, has, has really been instrumental in setting up the environmental protocols and um, frameworks for many, many international organizations, um, including uh, UNDP, UNEP, lots of UN um, uh, organizations, um, and is absolutely world renowned for his impact on us having less of an impact, um, uh, not just in India, but internationally. So welcome to the panel, um, Ashok. I wondered if you could um, talk to us about this incredibly important point um, the Green Alliance report is based on, um, the link between resource use and both climate change and biodiversity loss, and really why that link hasn't had that much airtime. Well, it's um, let let me let me just address. Um, first of all, I'm sorry I was absent from the screen because I got mixed up with summertime, wintertime. So I've um, sort of got myself sorted out on time, and I'm glad no to be problem. with you. Um, look, my uh, work on um, materials and um, its impacts on on human well-being uh, in a larger sense. Go back to. The, the mid 80s, when we form, formed uh, with a bunch of uh, European colleagues, uh, something called the Club of 10, the Factor of 10 Club. The Factor of 10 Club was in recognition of the fact that uh, materials, in, I, I don't want to contradict Lorraine, but um, there are ways in which you could demonstrate that material res resource consumption actually drives many of the other issues, including climate change, because energy actually is used for moving things. And a large part of energy goes into, into air conditioning and heating and cooling and, and lighting, but a very large part goes into construction, 22, 23% of the energy uh, used in the world is into that. And a large part of it goes into moving things, including transport, including varieties of uh, other uh, activities that human beings uh, rely on. So material 
use and consumption is actually a major driver. Uh, and we formulated a whole science behind it, uh, which is called material intensity mix, the material intensity per service unit uh, delivered, which is essentially the idea that um, while a car moves, and we usually look at the energy consumption of a car as the, as the petrol that goes into driving it, or the material consumption uh, as the material that's actually embodied in that car. But if you look at the upstream uh, and downstream impacts, uh, we call that the rucksack, the amount of material that actually went into delivering that gold ring which weighs, let's say, uh, you know, 100 grams or whatever, if you're really rich, on your finger, uh, actually costs 20 tons of material to deliver. So if you look at the full implications of materials, uh, you get uh, concerns that led us to set up the factor of 10 Club. Uh, there were a lot of people inside that who felt it was kind of unrealistic to try and bring the world's consumption of materials down by 10 and they formulated a subsidiary club called the Factor of Four Club. Uh, and these were very eminent scientists, including uh, Ernst von Weizsäcker in Germany, including uh, Bio Schmidt-Bleek also in Germany and many others. Uh, and I just want to put on the table that uh, material consumption is actually representative of a very large part of the causal uh, relationships that um, lead to things like climate change, biodiversity loss, um, and, and, and resource depletion of various kinds. Uh, so we've got actually, um, we don't have enough time to do that. If you look at the building behind me, this is the headquarters of my organization uh, in New Delhi, in South Delhi. Now, this building has been built with less than 30% virgin materials. Uh, it's, a, it's not only a symbol, symbol, but also a demonstration of the fact that you can do a lot more with a lot less. Uh, it uses waste materials like uh, fly ash from power stations. It uses waste materials from mining like stone dust. Uh, it uses uh, particularly waste materials from, from construction, demolition waste. Uh, in fact, the previous building in that plot was almost entirely recycled into this one. And you can see from the outside that it's fairly elegant, from the inside, it's one of the more creative uh, spaces, workspaces uh, in India. We've been offered very high rental um, figures to, to rent to people because it's a good place. Now, I, I, I show you that because it is possible to bring uh, not percentages, but factors uh, of three, four, five, six uh, uh, in terms of uh, using different kinds of technologies, materials, and so on in things that consume a lot of materials. Of course, the, you know, the market forces uh, have delivered a great deal of uh, reduction in material use. One of them is, of course, miniaturization. Um, the building that I had, uh, my, the computer, uh, in, uh, at, I used during my PhD research 45, 50 years ago, was in a, a building that, that was housed in a building which is not much smaller than my, my headquarters. It was huge. Today, the, your cell phone actually has more computing power than that entire computer that we had uh, in, the, in the mid 60s. So miniaturization has taken place. There's a limit to it because you know the human body and, and, and physical things do have certain dimensions, but Miniaturization by market forces has taken place, which has reduced, enormously reduced um, uh, the footprint of material footprint. Uh, the second way to reduce uh, material footprints is uh, durability, increase, increasing the, uh, the life of products. And if you obviously, if you, uh, your car works for 15 years instead of seven, seven, you're going to use half as much materials overall. Uh, and, and durability, the market forces have been generally against. The issue of durability has to be more or less forced above the market because the market demands changes in fashion, changes in, 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 um, in expectations, um, model changes, because the marketing systems we, we've adopted depend on uh, gross uh, you know, turning over of, of materials. Uh, 
Um, there are other things, shared, the shared economy that's um, been uh, talked about and, uh, and is actually a very good way. But there are two kinds of shared economy. There's the private sector shared economy like Uber and, and um, you know, uh, renting rooms and so on, um, which work well within the market. The public transport, the public shared uh, utilities, particularly in transport and other, other resources, uh, is not so sexy. So there you have basically a, an issue uh, of, uh, of resistance by the public to switch to, to shared modes. So um, coming to, uh, try to, having said all this, I want to just add, add, try to answer the question you, you raised and one of the chat, one of the questions raised in the chat, which is why is there resistance to doing the right thing? Why is it that we find it hard to uh, move into uh, domains of behavior that would be good for the planet, good for people, good for society. Uh, and that I think is, is, is really the central question. Um, to a large extent, it's because it's driven by, by market interests, by lobbies that have an interest, uh, a vested interest in increasing uh, material use rather than reducing it. And they're very powerful. They're, they're people who really, as you can see in the US to, uh, in the previous administration, have tremendous influence on, uh, on public policy. Uh, there are probably very many other reasons, uh, but I, before, I, before I stop, I do want to say that things in the North, which is represented by most of the participants in this meeting, um, are very different from things in the South. If you ask me, a large part of the three billion people in the, on the planet who, who live in the global South are actually under consumers. There are people actually who do need to use more than, than, than they do today. Why? Because their lives are so poor that the only way that they actually get fulfillment, what you might call well-being, is by having bigger families, by having, by, by, by in fact, uh, being counterproductive through demographic rather than through uh, economic uh, resource use. So, and, and in the long run, that really has a huge impact. In fact, I wrote a paper once for the COP15 in, 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 in Copenhagen um, to demonstrate with a mathematical model that the cheapest way to reduce carbon emission is actually the education of girls and livelihoods for women, paid, proper, good, well-paid livelihoods for women. Because by doing those two things, you actually have a huge impact, demographic impact on birth rates and therefore on family size. And that has a much, much higher uh, medium-term impact on carbon emissions than, uh, than virtually anything else. Planting trees, uh, uh, improving you know, the efficiency of power stations, whatever. Uh, so I, I think one has to be very careful not to overstate the need for uh, reducing consumption. We actually have a good part of the world, maybe one, one third or one half, where can there, the, the underconsumption is actually holding back the, the planetary values that we're espousing. So it may be you know, second order, third order effects, but they're actually very big effects. So I just want to leave that on the table. Okay. I know I've you. taken more time than you expected me to. But don't worry, don't you. worry. Thank you very much. Um, and um, well, I mean, I think many of us here think that the education of girls is really, really uh, fundamental. Uh, whatever the outcomes, um, but I also, I also would like, I also think that it moves us into kind of really interesting territory, which we probably don't have that much time to discuss about material justice, which is also a very, very interesting, um, interesting idea. Um, thank you so much to pick up on. We're going to go to Colin because I think Colin flows on very nicely from some of what you, of, of what you said, and then we're going to start taking some questions. <laughs> Um, and thank you um, for answering some questions as you went along, because that's very helpful. We've got loads coming in. Um, Colin, um, we, we heard a little bit there about um, uh, uh, the role of um, business. And I wondered if you could elaborate that and just about whether people are getting this or not and whether you think that there is appetite um, among business leaders to look um, at contracting um, resource use. Where where are they in this? Thanks very much indeed. And and yeah, as as um, Dr. Kojal was speaking, I was thinking, yeah, now I can see some links to what I was thinking about talking about. I, I think 
everything that, that, that Dr. Gosler said is, is, is right, I think, in terms of the macro context. Um, I think, though, that it is possible to think about how companies, manufacturers in particular, are starting to worry about material efficiency. If you think about a manufacturing business, and, and I'm deliberately focusing on manufacturing rather than service for obvious reasons, the sorts of costs that you'll have are the inputs, so energy and materials, labor, equipment, and property. And uh, evidence has shown time and time again that there's real scope to reduce your costs uh, through uh, energy and through materials through greater efficiency. You can be more competitive. And for uh, uh, companies in a, in, in a country like the UK where we're not likely to be competing on labor costs, it's one of the few costs that we might be able to compete on to make ourselves more uh, competitive. So why isn't more happening? And, and, and Lisa, you asked earlier, why doesn't the market do it all for us? And I think it's, it's, it's fairly classic thinking in this space. There are a number of barriers to, to individual companies acting, knowledge about what might be possible, inertia, you know, I've always done it this way, why should I change? Uh, management time, if you're too busy with the day job, getting the next client, answering the client query, or whatever else, spending time to think more long term is more problematic. Access to finance is always a problem. Um, can't get the upfront investments to make these changes, whatever these changes might be. Um, and also fundamentally, of course, uh, measurement. We all know that what gets measured matters. Well, the opposite is true as well. If you don't measure it, it doesn't matter, or very often is seen as not mattering. So th there are lots of reasons why an individual company may not be engaging in either energy or materials efficiency to the extent that a dispassionate outside well-informed observer might think would be would be logical. And that's before you get into the sorts of conversations that um, Dr. Kosler was talking about around the Mm, the, 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 the sort of emphasis on, on, on getting people to buy more stuff and, and, and so on and so forth. And fundamentally, of course, the price signals and the regulatory signals coming into uh, those manufacturers aren't strong enough very often to overcome those barriers. And yes, there are exceptions and you can see that starting to grow with you know, some of the big um, electronics and consumer goods companies starting to think about um, make, maintaining a greater degree of circularity with their products and their resources and so on and so forth. But for your average manufacturer, often those signals are not strong enough. But we're starting to see those starting to improve. So fluctuating raw material prices can make the cost of materials more obvious. If that price is always more or less the same in your accounts, you don't notice it. If sometimes it's up here and sometimes it's down here, you're more likely to notice it. And if you notice it, you might measure it. If you measure it, you might do something about it. I think the, the, the uh, disruptions that we've had to the global supply chains from Brexit and COVID and maybe even um, uh, from the Suez Canal blockage are starting to highlight to people some of the supply chain risks. People might remember a good few years ago now there was a bit of flooding in Thailand and all of a sudden the world market for computer hard disks went into a tailspin because it turned out and nobody really realised that most of them were made by factories that were on this floodplain. And that sort of thing triggers people to worry more about their supply chain risks. Geopolitical concerns over supply definitely coming forward. Critical raw materials we've mentioned a couple of times already. When you look at where they come from, the risks that we have by not being able to better control that uh, demand for ourselves are quite big and growing. Growing pressure on ethical supply of materials. Um, and then for people like Green Alliance and Ellen MacArthur Foundation and RAP and so on, starting to raise awareness. And again, other people have made the point, if this narrative is underserved, this narrative about the importance of materials efficiency, well, that's absolutely going to be the case for business managers as well. They are also people in our society. And if nobody else is getting those messages, then why would they be getting them? So there's definitely barriers. We can start to see some reasons why those barriers are starting to be addressed but there's a lot more to be done. And I think there's a real role here for government action. And it's the classic set of things that you can do, carrot and stick. We ought to be able to look to our government to provide more advice directly or via organisations such as RAP that help people understand what could be done and how to do it in a cost-effective and sensible way. Um, funding support, whether that's grants or tax breaks, such as R&D credits or reduced VAT for repairs, you know, the classic sort of things that people in this sector are talking about, but really haven't yet driven out into the wider economy. And then the stick, law and tax. 
Um, those are the two most important ones, I think, that we all need to talk about. Uh, you do need to set the frames because if you want to take another economic view across this piece, what we're talking about is trying to internalize an external cost. You know, businesses don't pay for the biodiversity and climate change costs of extracting, treating and transporting materials. If they had to pay for them, there'd be a bigger incentive to do less, to use less rather. So the real uh, issues there about tax and legislation. And of course, there's the age old canard of public procurement because um, that can always play an interesting role in this kind of space as well. So there are barriers. We can start to see some of the pressures to um, address those barriers, but they still exist, particularly for smaller companies. And by goodness me, there's a role for government in trying to address that. So do you broadly think, Colin, that the um, that the proposals of having these targets as, as contained in the in the Green Alliance report, do you think that would help to focus um, minds attention and lead to um, uh, some real kind of change? Well, I'd chair the Circular Economy Task Force. You'd be gobsmacked if I disagreed with what the report said, wouldn't you? <laughs> I th can I think, always try. I think, <laughs> I think really, you, you have to have that overarching, coherent, strategic level targetry into which you fit more specific um, actions. If you don't have the overarching one, then you've got the risk going off left, right and centre. Okay. If you look back before carbon budgets were properly introduced, you had people firing off uh, activity on reducing carbon all over the place and sometimes contradicting. So you need the overarching framework. And then you need specific things for specific people to do do this by then or else. And just really briefly, so if you look at the circular economy action program, the EU thing, what what how much of, of that do you think is in place to cause a real shift? 60%, 70%? Within the UK or or, or in the EU? In the EU. Um I, I think that there's a lot more that needs to be done in that kind of space, but the thinking is going in the right direction. OK, I wouldn't put a percentage on it because that would be arbitrary, I'm afraid. OK, <laughs> I love an arbitrary percentage. Right. OK, we're going to take some questions because there's loads of them. We're running out of time. So, Joe, um, you're going to uh, come and help me with some questions, please. Yes, thank you. And loads of great questions in the chat. Um, so try and get through lots of them. I thought we'd start off with some that were around governance that were kind of most popular. So I guess this is an open question around sort of political will and come, kind of uh, circling back to the idea of an overarching framework. Do you think the UK needs to help political will along? Do you think they need a, C a, like a new CCC for biodiversity and, and resource use? And if, the, if we do have that, how can we ensure that that, um, that body focuses on sort of global emissions and not just UK emissions as the current UK CCC does? Who's that to? I guess maybe we'll start off with Libby since it, it links to the front. Um, yeah, I think that we would definitely benefit from some more official sounding uh, scientific advice about what we need to do. Um, so there is the obviously the UN International Resources Panel, which has a lot of good research, and that's where the compelling statistic uh, that we've heard so many times today comes from. But when it comes to sort of do domestic um, infra do domestic bodies that would provide that same sort of advice, it's really, really lacking. And so I think that it, it, it is something that people have called for and something that does absolutely make sense. And just in terms of how that would help address the impacts, uh, our overseas impacts, I think that this, this was one of the key ways that you can actually address the emissions as well as the resources, because the UK's um, resource footprint occurs mainly abroad and, and we do drive a lot of emissions abroad as well. And so if we had something that was focusing on overall resource use, on overall material footprints, I think it would it would automatically follow that we would then also be reducing our consumption footprint. And that has to be something that the UK government, uh, as part of its moral duty to lead on this, it really, really picks up and runs with. Great. Um, that's great. Did anyone else want to come in that in on that? Cool. I, I thought the next question would be quite good just to talk a bit around the sort of tax and economic system. If we're missing any of the changes to that system, which could really help to 
uh, sort of push forward the circular economy or kind of change options which are currently constraining it. And particularly there was a question around uh, carbon tax as well. So perhaps we could start off with Colin on that. Yeah, I, I, I think if you start from the premise that it's all about internalizing external costs, then something like a carbon tax or a materials tax or whatever else absolutely makes sense. The concern I've always got is how difficult it is to put in place um, and how difficult it is to do it in a, an equitable manner. So yes, I'd love, I'd love for that to be the case so long as we can address those other issues. In the meantime, should we actually do something rather than ponce around and um, not solve the problem? Maybe just to come in, I, I think the equitable, equ uh, the, the equity point is a really good one. So I think from the discussions that we had, for example, in the Climate Assembly UK, which was you know this big citizens assembly on climate change, we had we had a lot of discussion around things we buy and how we can re reduce emissions from consumption, um, and e equitability was one of the or equity was one of the key. Uh, concerns that people had so so making sure that people on lower incomes for example are not left behind that if we have a tax does that just mean that rich people can just continue you know we're consuming as much as they want etc so being fair was really key um and with that in mind i think there was more support for sort of economic instruments to be maybe targeted more on the production side than on the consumption side um and sort of we know from the example of say the sugar tax that actually if you do target those sorts of measures at uh, industry, they can then kind of innovate their products to kind of improve them, make them healthier or greener or whatever. Um, and so the consumer then gets, you know, potentially the same quality of product, uh, potentially at the same price, but they're, they're just better made or they're, you know, they're, they're greener, they're lower emission, etc. So, um, uh, so, so there is a, there may be more of an argument to focus those incentives on the production side um, from that equity point of view. I just jump in, in to say that uh, I think whether or not you're focusing on the production side or the consumption side, there's, it, it's clear that the tax system hasn't been used to anything like the extent that it could be used to drive the sort of economy that we want to see. This is one of the most, this is one of the biggest tools that government has. And sometimes it's, it's driving uh, perversities. And in a lot of instances, it's not driving the sort of thing that we want to see. And so we've done some, some thinking about VAT for, for another project, the UK's tax on consumption. And at the moment, there are some really, really poor incentives built into that. So things like the, the new build has, is zero rated for VAT, but then the repair and refurbishment is charged a full 20% VAT. And so obviously that skews things massively in favor of, of new build construction, which is one of the biggest, uh, the biggest emitters and the biggest users of materials in the UK. And you've also got things like the VAT on repair is, is charged full, full rate. And obviously one of the biggest barriers to people getting repairs is, is, high, is the high cost of it. And charging full VAT on that makes it even more inaccessible to a lot of people. And that's not actually the case in a lot of countries. A lot of European countries have as low as 7% VAT on some repairs. And now that we've left the EU, the UK actually could zero rate repairs to stimulate the economy if they want to. And that, that's something that the government should be, should be promoting, absolutely. What did you think of the um, right to repair law that um, came into effect very recently? Will that make a change and does it bring anything? I think that it's, it's absolutely uh, the right step. It's what the government promised it would do when it voted in favour of those, uh, those regulations as a member of the EU in 2019. So I think it, it, it's, it's a start. It doesn't actually provide a right to repair to people. It just means that um, products have to be available to professional repair, uh, parts have to be available to professional repairers. So I think it's a bit of a, a misrepresentation of what the right to repair is. Um, but that sort of thing could definitely have have a big impact, especially if the idea that it needs to be affordable, which is part of what the right to repair movement wants to see, if that's taken seriously. Great, thanks. Uh, I just thought now we could move a bit onto the behaviour change, um, some behaviour change questions that have got asked. So I wondered, and perhaps uh, Lorraine, you can start with this, but it was around how we drive behaviour change and what what you think if there's a role for um, education, particularly in schools, and also whether or not there's a role for the government in kind of helping the media um, advertise some of the low carbon options like swap shops and, and repair, repair services and things. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think education and information is is definitely one part of what we need to encourage behaviour change. So as I've mentioned, awareness of the environmental impacts uh, or, or broader impacts of our consumption is pretty low amongst the public. Um, and so definitely providing information through formal education, through better labelling about, you know, what can be recycled and what are the carbon impacts and, uh, of our products, etc., is really important. Um, but we do know that information alone tends not to be very effective by itself in changing behaviour. So we need these broader carrots, as uh, carrots and sticks, as um, uh, Colin uh, refers to them. So lots of you know incentives, disincentives, rules um, to make things easier, more convenient, more normal. Um, uh, so yeah, we definitely need all of that. And I think the media is a definitely a key player, as as, as you've said. Um, so we need to think about kind of maybe maybe regulating advertising or at least having sort of health warnings on very high carbon products or something so that, so that you know, using that partly as a vehicle for raising awareness, but also actually just reducing the availability of marketing information about these sorts of products that conveys this idea that we need to be consuming um, so much. Um, yeah, there's lots more to say, but I'll let Colin or someone else chip in. Thanks. Um, I, I, I was going to make a couple of points. One is that, um, so I, I used to work in, in, in DEFRA and we did some work looking at the uh, different ways that we were trying to incentivize or, or, or push people to recycle more. And one of the big lessons that came out of that work, and I think it's true, it certainly resonates for me, is that uh, individuals are much more likely to change their behaviors to avoid attacks than they are to change their behaviors in line with a positive incentive. There's something weird about our psychology that if we can do the tax man out of a penny, sorry about the gender stereotype there, but um, then we'd rather do that than get um, them to give us 5p. It's weird, but it seems to work that way. And that I think is another reason to go with what Libby was saying earlier, why the tax system has such a potentially key role in this kind of space because of that asymmetric reaction that people have to taxation. Can I just make a really quick point about the media? Sorry, I know I'm not, I'm not on the panel, but I just wanted to say, um, I don't know if you remember early on in, in lockdown, Dr. Kostler, I'm talking about um, a UK context again. Um, we had the advertising industry launched um, a series of sort of animations about the Great Reset. And it was building on this idea that people were so into nature because they'd experienced spring up close, that when we built back, it had to be green. Is there anything in that? Because again, that speaks to this connection between the impact of material goods on biodiversity on nature. And doesn't that bring us back to the same problem or same focus? People don't get that connection. Um, yeah, would, they I think, would they behave differently? I think um, it's, um, it's a connection that's not easily made. Uh, and for those who make it, they have short memories. You know, after a short while, they forget uh, how strongly they felt about uh, having um, the song of birds and the, and the you know clean air to breathe uh, uh, for the period during which things were not good. Um, I I think a, a great deal of uh, what needs to be said on this has been said by Lorraine, by by Colin and Libby. Um, you know, there's a, a combination of uh, needs like um, uh, through the formal and informal educational system, through faith-based organizations, through media, through games, through video games. There are all kinds of things we could use, and there are more and more of them. Social media uh, do have an impact. I mean, there's no question that um, they, they are peer-based peer communications is, is a powerful mechanism for... Um, change bringing about changing behavior but you know ultimately the issue is what does it cost me as a consumer uh or what does it pay me as a producer uh to change my behavior and i think to some extent this all boils down to full cost pricing and full cost full cost benefits full full you know um accounting systems that take uh, account of these and then translate them into the actual market prices. And that of course is through incentives and, and, and taxes. Uh, it's, it's probable that long-term change can only happen through a pretty fundamental 
um, cathartic experience. I, I've come more and more to believe that the changes that we need are either going to come uh, from from a catastrophe, which which is not very different from what we've been through the last uh, 12 months, uh, through crises of various types, including major financial crises, or through charisma. Now, charisma, you know, comes once a millennium. You, you have a Jesus Christ or a Lord Buddha or, you know, St. Francis of Assisi or Mahatma Gandhi, they come along and they, through the force of their um, their their message and, and their ability to communicate, do bring about change, but that's very rare. Uh, I, Greta? I think, sorry? Greta? Greta Thunberg? Yeah. Do you think she's yeah. one of the one of the people that I, can bring about? I, I, well, I'm, I'm personally not that convinced about it, but maybe maybe that's how it'll turn out. History would show. Um, it's it seems to me that um, the the force of uh, of moral authority that that people had in the past uh, hasn't really appeared recently, uh, but but I may be wrong. But yes, you're right. I mean, Greta Thunberg and, and others uh, may well be a substitute for that. But I think I think we've had the crises, and we've got a vision, and we've got a, a glimpse of what crises can happen very quickly without our being prepared for them. And so I think to some extent um, we've got to sort of latch onto them and write piggyback on them as fast as we can, uh, people like, like us on the screen, who insist that um, the polit political leaders and, the, and our, our government, government officials uh, listen to these. The business people will only listen to uh, financial indicators, uh, whether they make money or not, the bottom line. And there, I think it can only be done by the public authorities through what we were talking about earlier taxes and incentives of various types. Joe, we're going to have a, a, a um, final killer question, right? Yeah, yeah, one time for one more question. Um, and I thought it'd be good just to take it to the more global level, um, because we've been talking quite a lot on kind of national scale. So how do we ensure that tackling resource use is done in the most equitable way possible so that wealthier countries understand that they have a bigger role in uh, tackling their consumption than they uh, currently do. Um, so should we start with Ashok, maybe? Um, it's, it's embedded. The answer to that is embedded in what we've all been saying, essentially. Uh, the the uh, um, present mindset, uh, and, and you know, I, I, I'm not bad at spelling, but the mindset to me uh, is actually three mindsets. One is what's mine is mine and what's yours is up for grabs. Uh, the second mindset uh, is, you know, if they natives don't give you what you want, mine and bomb them. Uh, and, and the third mindset is, um, you know, um, mine the earth uh, for and mother earth for whatever and rape her as far as you can. Now, these three mindsets are not going to suddenly change. Uh, they are um, millennial. And we, we need we need green green alliances we need people like us to really keep hammering away till people feel guilty uh, and I don't think that the upper point one percent will ever feel guilty that's really the problem but basically it's now through forcing people to uh, to feel bad about what they're doing to the rest of the world um, I you know the people that need to be trained how home house trained, actually don't care about what kind of a world they leave behind for the kids. You know, it's, it's really quite astounding to me that people are making decisions that they know cannot possibly be good for their next generation. And, and yet they do that. So uh, the answer to your question is uh, we've got to work very hard at it. I'm not pessimistic. I think we will make it happen. But it will happen probably more from a catastrophes happening than from anything else. Okay, okay, let's, um, let's, we're getting really running out of time. I'm so sorry. Colin, could you uh, give, us, give us your perspective and then we'll hear from Lorraine and then Libby. I, I struggle to disagree with the word that Ashok just said, to be honest. I think there's a, there's a lot in, in, in what he said. Um, and I, I do, I am less optimistic and I do think that probably the thing that will move us uh, significantly down this road is a catastrophe of some description. 
So that's rather glum. So I hope somebody else has got a more positive note to. Uh, to so do that. I. Lorraine. I think we need to shout about all of the benefits of reducing our consumption that are not only environmental, which not all of us can necessarily relate to, but are really more immediate, tangible. They make us feel better. It's about connecting with other people. It's about having more fulfilling activities. The more we can say there are these individual benefits, there are economic benefits, there are opportunities for engaging in the circular economy for business, etc. The more we can say that, the more I think we are going to be moving in the right direction. So I'm reasonably optimistic. Thank you, Libby. I think I'll just end by highlighting that there are some really good opportunities for the international community to get this right this year. We've got the, the G7, which obviously the UK is hosting and they can put, they can put things on the table. We've got the COP15 Biodiversity Summit and the COP26 Climate Change Summit. And these are all opportunities where they, well, first of all, at the first one where the big emitters uh, and those with the material and carbon footprint that outstrips the world's capacity to, to deal with uh, can can set the agenda and then along with the other international the rest of the international community hopefully really really talk about how this can be addressed together okay thank you i want to say thank you to everyone who's attended um i'm sure we'll try and harvest your questions and get back to you because there were some amazing questions uh thanks joe for helping with those uh huge thanks to um our panelists um for joining us today uh and please check out the report and also hashtag ga event if you want to carry on this conversation on twitter um thank you green alliance uh for inviting me i'm lucy siegel and um i'll see you next time <laughs>